I know you're going to dig this. McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Now, zooming in all the way from London, England, Skip McDonald, and zooming in all the way from Hartford, Connecticut, Doug Wimpish, for Sugar Hill Records, specializing in hip-hop music that was founded in 1979. Welcome, and thank you for agreeing to come on our show, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. You know, it, you know when we start, um, I, I get so, I'm so excited, I always get so excited when we're talking about funk music, musicians, how you get to be and where you are, uh, the history of how you come about. So I'm going to start off with Skip and ask Skip, how did you, since you ha have some Dayton history here, how did you get involved with music and lead us up to when you became with Living Color? No, that's me that came with Living Color. Yeah. <laughs> we get this story straight. We get it We're right. going, okay, yeah. I got to get to, you. Skip, you're with Sugar Hill. Yeah, I was with Sugar Hill and uh, actually I was born in Dayton, Ohio. I played with groups in Dayton up until I was about 18 years old. I had a, who a short did you, Who all did you mm -hmm. play with, Skip? Oh, God. Um, when I was, uh, I think, 14, 13, 14, I played with the Ohio Untouchables, who uh, later became... I remember the Untouchables, yes. Yeah, I, I, I played with them for, I guess, a month, a couple months or something, but I was a bit too young. And um, and as it goes, uh, I was replaced by uh, Sugarfoot, Leroy Bonner. And that led me to uh, New Haven, Connecticut, where we had a band called the Ohio Hustlers. And that was for a period of about two, three years, four years. That led me to Doug Wimish. I think we met in uh, 72, 73, Doug. That's right. And we had a band called Wood, Brass, and Steel. We had a short stint with a group called uh, Music, which was a um, house music base. And from there, we went to Sugar Hill and the Sugar Hill Gang. That would have been 1979, September of 1979. Now, who all was in the Sugar Hill Gang? Uh, you talking all the people? That well, the be, original, uh, the originals. And, the and, originals and, were um, obviously uh, Master T, Guy O'Brien, Wonder Mike, uh, uh, he was uh, Mike Wright and uh, Hank, Hank Jackson, that was uh, Big Bang Hank, and the band was myself, um, Keith LeBlanc, um, ooh, come on Doug, help me out here. Craig Derry. Craig Derry. Um, Wayne Mitchell on keyboards, and um, 
I was kind of like the core in myself. That was the core. Yeah. It was the core. So how did the Sugar Hill Gang get their name? Uh, Sugar Hill was an area in New York, a uh, Harlem section. And it was a name that was devised by uh, Sylvia Robinson. I think Sylvia actually lived in the Sugar Hill area, if I got this story right. And uh, that's where the name came from. It was uh, based on um, Sugar Hill area of um, uh, in Harlem. So, so when when we're talking about the Sugar Hill Gang, um, what what do you think made the Sugar Hill Gang band so special? And 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 your genre of music. Hmm. Go, cool, Doug. Well, I think it was a, it was just the perfect timing. Skip and I had been playing together for five years, six years at that time, when we were already with the label, All Platinum Records, which preceded Sugar Hill Records. So when Sugar Hill emerged in 1979, Skip and I were already familiar with Sylvia. She always took a shining to us and when Rapper's Delight was recorded, which we were not on, she reached out to us to be able to come down to the new label, Sugar Hill Records, because now there's a huge hit with Rapper's Delight. So I think it was just that connection of, of Sylvia, Wood, Brass, and Steel as the band and her being comfortable enough to know that she has musicians she's worked with, she's comfortable, that can help usher in working with rappers and being able to bridge as musicians the sound that Sylvia heard, what the rappers heard, and what we were all collectively able to create as you know, as this unit, which really was the band, Sylvia, and all of the rappers. It's just good timing. And uh, we just had a lot of fun. We just enjoyed making music. And it took us many places with that one hit record, it took us a lot of places across the world. Just, Good time, I'd say. So just good time. So where were some of the fun places that you went that you really enjoyed? Oh, Lord. Any place outside of Hartford was fun at the time. That's <laughs> 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 that for real. You know, Skip and I had done, we, Skip had been all over the place prior. For me, you know, it was, it was with the Sugar Hill Gang, what really took off was when we were all, when we were opening up for Parliament Funkadelic on the Knee Deep Tour in 1979. And that was, in my opinion, our first kind of real tour. It was our first real tour. Bands got a hit record, Rapper's Delight, and we're out with George Clinton. And thanks to George, who had his ear to the ground and was had heard about rap he was like i want to have these guys open up so that was the first big adventure so to say where we toured america and then following in 1980 skip if i'm right we went off to europe with the sugar hill gang i that think was... we went to holland mm -hmm. germany england we went to um Argentina, we uh, uh, combed the islands. Uh, I think I went. You went to uh, Santo Domingo and Mexico. Uh, it was very adventurous. <laughs> it was, you know, at that time, it was like 
people were, had never seen rap music performed live in Europe and even across America at that time. It was... Especially with a band. Especially with a band. So when Skip and I and, and the band went off to Europe, it was like we were sent off to Mars. <laughs> it was like, here we are, the first group presenting hip hop abroad with a band. Because everybody else stayed back at the studio. They were all left back in, in New Jersey. We were the ones that were, all right, you guys, go out there. And let us know how it goes. So kind of like the... Yeah, we were the we were the first to present rap music to the world as as a with the Sugar Hill Gang. Yeah, so that was a that was <clears throat> very adventurous, um, very rewarding, and we got a chance to see other cultures and experience what it was like to be out of the country. For a long period of time and also skip we were gone long periods of time as well i remember it was you we were out on the road for a while i mean Good when you days. say long time you're talking like months 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 <laughs> i mean being yeah. away from home for months yeah. i mean that i mean that's that's been a long way from home you got to remember, that was back in 1979, 1980. You didn't have well, a cell I'm still, phone. At, I'm still not home. He's still out on the road. Skip has <laughs> been still on the road. Since. Retired. <laughs> but Skip is right. I mean, he's been gone longer than everybody. And back then, there was no, you couldn't communicate like you can now. Um, to just call your family and say hi you know, would cost a fortune. And simple things that we take for granted, you know, we found ourselves in a situation where you have you come together even more as a band and as brothers. As a unit. Yeah. As a unit. You, 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 we needed each other to survive. There were many scenes that took place that were good, and there was the bad and the ugly. And, you know, you need to be able to have enough people to handle a situation. And fortunately, for meeting Skip and, you know, the, the Wood Brass and Steel crew, which is which was the Sugar Hill, you know, band, which became the Sugar Hill band, we had enough, we had enough people within our core unit that we could depend on. And that's, yeah, that's true. true. That was good. It, it, it sounds to me as if a support system was extremely important and you, you know you all were very young during that time too to be that far away from home and just playing music and enjoying life how, how did they receive you in uh, Holland you mentioned Holland mm, to tell you the truth the people were just as surprised as we were <laughs> <laughs> there were some good times and there were some bad times. There were some really horrible times and some lovely times. Skip is classic. He's right. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, you know, Skip is spot on. The, the, what were the good times? You know, we would, we would... and the reason why I chose Holland to ask you about. I mean, I I know that. A lot of our bands and musicians have gone to Germany, and because we had bases in Germany, there was some acceptance to that. But when you mentioned Holland, it really caught my attention to say, whoa, how did you all get there uh, on this tour? It was a hit record. Rapper's Delight was caught on like fire. And it's caught, it started from the, you know, the U.S. and then it crossed over and started going to different places across the world. So when a tour was put together for us to go to Europe, it was more of a promo. It was kind of like a promo tour and concerts were taking place as well. So the first place we, when we, in 1980, when we left America, the first destination was Holland. 
and we were based in Holland for a couple of weeks in Amsterdam, um, and we stayed at the Senesta Hotel, and then we were in Tilburg in southern Holland. And then after that, we were there for a couple of weeks. And then we went to Skip, and we went to Germany. Germany, yeah. And we were based in like Kassel and different strategic places. Why? Because the Sugar Hill Gang, the rappers would do prom promo events during the day, go on television, and then maybe at night we had some shows. Mm -hmm. So we were based in one area, but it was great because being in Amsterdam was like being in another planet at the time. <laughs> it was just like, wow. <laughs> you know, woo. So, and, we, and then we went, so we Amsterdam a period of time. So you had a chance to see what was going on, meet the people, play some music, see some, but we worked a lot. Mm -hmm. We went to Germany, met some folk. We played at the Star Club where the Beatles performed at in Hamburg. We went to some landmark places. And um, Skip, we went to Paris too, didn't we? We went to uh, England first. We went back to America, and then we went to uh, Paris. Okay. If I remember right. Well, I think what we did, we didn't go, maybe to, just to add in, I think we went, I think we didn't go back to America. Once we went to Europe, we stayed there. So with the, not sure of the sequence, but Skip is right. England, France, we did a gig, Belgium, Germany, and Holland. Those were the, those were the places we kind of touched base on. And I skip if I'm right, we were there for about a month. Something like that in that in that time frame, because we were based in Holland for at least a couple of weeks. Right. Anyway, that was that was the first time, as Skip mentioned, it was just as much of an event for us as it was for the fans. And the band only the the there was only one song that Sugar Hill had. It was one song. <laughs> it wasn't like we had a repertoire of a whole bunch of and it was one long song, too. <laughs> and it was just one long song with two chords going on. So <laughs> and it was so but hey. It was a good song. It was a good <laughs> song. No, we did have problems um, in the earlier days because we didn't have a repertoire because um, in Europe, we were doing shows that were lasting an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Whereas when we were in America, the show would last 20 minutes. That's right. So um, it was a great awakening for us musically when we went to Europe because the uh, fans wanted a more intimate, intimate look into what the band was doing. Whereas when we were in America, they were more interested in what the raps were doing. That's true. That's an interesting uh, contrast, but it also makes sense when when you look at how many of our bands uh, really jump-started in Europe and came back home. And, and, and I think that's because of the music. And because you remember when you talked about the Beatles, uh, their music in London, but their singing in America. Mm hmm Yeah. So, uh, that, that that makes sense as as uh, as you delve into this whole era of trying to understand. Now we take this we get, we, we really delved into the Sugar Creek, Sugar Hill, Sugar, Sugar. I like Hill. Sugar Creek. <laughs> no, there, 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 believe me, there's a pa packaging plant here in Dayton, Ohio, called Sugar Creek, um, but Sugar Hill. When when you analyze your career with Sugar Hill, what are your takeaways? What are your takeaways from that experience? 
as musicians, as, as understanding the music genre. What, what, what are your takeaways? Mm. It's a hard question for me because there's so many different takeaways from it. You know, the uh, attitude of the band, the attitude of the uh, crowds, and what el whatever else was going on. It's a very hard question for me. You know, yes, you know, the takeaway, <clears throat> we survived, Sugar <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Survival. Um, there was a lot of good things that took place at Sugar Hill. We met a lot of people. We were able to work with the rappers. We were able to help a lot of the rappers as well. Some of them had not been in a studio before, not much studio experience, so. Well, they if I remember it. right, the rappers, that was their first encounter with the studio, period. True. With a hit record to boot. So we were kind of, well, not kind of, we were helping to groom the bands, the artists, whether it was in the studio and on the road with the Sugar Hill Gang. We groomed, we kind of worked all together. The artists would grab it, would kind of come towards Skip and look for advice, that, looking yeah. for advice. And we were able to bring in other people to, to help create the music as well. It was a, it was, came opportunities for other musicians that we were able to usher in as other artists became popular and started to go out on the road like they needed other bands. And we were working with the Sugar Hill Gang who couldn't perform with everybody. So Sequence took a band out on the road. We were able to get some friends to work with them. And, also the West Street Mob. So that being, you know, it was a lot of opportunities for us to be able to be in this, to, to perform live, be patient, really. We just had to be patient. That was the most important thing. Being patient, because uh, we were studio musicians, we were writing songs, we were producing, and it was happening at the speed of light sometimes. But then it seemed like also things would just slow down. So you had this kind of rush and then kind of like- Hurry up and wait. <laughs> yeah, hurry up and wait kind of vibe. But the key, the takeaway was we were in the studio, we recorded a lot, we met a lot of people, we were able to network, took us around different places, different cities, we made our contacts. And the most important thing of all, we stayed together. We stayed unified. It was a situation that could, there could be a situation where you could take the golden carry. That means sometimes when you're with a band, people see an opportunity for themselves and they go for it. And then the band, finds has a hole in it you know so in this case we we all stayed together and if whatever took place if somebody had an opportunity we supported them and i think that to me was the takeaway and what's really most important is we're still together we're still friends now and we're still playing that's to me is take i think i think that's an awesome takeaway that that even after all of that time that uh, you, you, you're still together. And you know, and that's one of the things that I have found to be so interesting in the business about when it comes to musicians, is that musicians have a, a different sense of brotherhood or sisterhood that is unique to any other kind of industry. Um, and you, you just uh, reconfirmed or affirmed uh, my thinking in that way when you talked about that as part of one of the serious takeaways. And if you had to change one thing from that experience, what would it have been? 
asking some hard questions, aren't you, Ryan? <laughs> so I'm gonna let Skip handle that one. I wouldn't change anything to tell you the truth. I've had um, I've had a good run. You know, not uh, you know, uh, we're not millionaires, if you know what I mean. But we have a relationship that has lasted since '73 until now. With all the things that change, and band members change, and groups change, and we're still here. It's, love. it's called love. Mm. We have love for each other. I was fortunate to meet Skip. That's my brother. If I didn't meet Skip, I probably wouldn't be talking to you here right now because of the beauty of that brother and what he has done for me personally. As a friend, that's my brother forever and ever. What he taught me, what he showed me, his patience, his calm, it was that that got us through the finish line, around the corner, underwater, through the tunnels and everything else. So it's that person, it's that person. And for, thanks to Skip personally, he was able to help navigate us through some murky waters with just logic and common sense. Love you. Mm -hmm. Love you, Skip. It's just All the right, truth. Same to you, Doug. Oh, that is so touching. That was a, a very <laughs> common moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth, you know, and it's just, you know, I hope everybody in life can have that experience. And as a musician, music is a reflection of our life. How you live, it comes out in your music. And for the blessings that we have had have been the family and the love and the relationship and how we were challenged and how we were able to stay calm and poised or sometimes you got to go hey <laughs> and What's deal with it you yeah. know what the heck's going on here but you yeah. do it collectively you do it with love what were some of the bands that you all might have been an opening act for that uh really inspired you or helped you uh, as an old expression, tighten it up? Um, oh, there so, would be loads and loads. Um, some artists that highlight, that, that you find in your, that in your career that you were glad that they crossed your path. Oh, there's loads. Uh, Bunny Sigler, uh, Felipe Wynn. Um, Felipe? From the Spinners? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, we, we, we were at Sugar Hill. We touched on lots and lots of people. There's lots of tapes that I would love to have right now from sessions that never were released. We did stuff with Wilson Pickett. We did things with Candy Staten. Mm -hmm. We did sessions with Felipe Wynn, uh, Chuck Jackson, and the list goes on and on and on for, from um, from the um, before and after Sugar Hill. So what happens to that music, or what happened to that taping, or what uh, happened? They're all on dusty old tape set that are, are would never. Uh, it's gone. It's, it's music that's gone forever. And it's really sad, but it's, it's things that I would love to have uh, kept them. At the time, you don't know it. Yeah. You don't notice it. You really don't. Our time go, goes by so fast. Yeah. But I can remember Felipe Wynn. I can remember um, Wilson Pickett, I can remember uh, his stories and things that I, I, you know, you couldn't, you wouldn't believe it if, if you, if you saw it or heard it, you still wouldn't believe it. You know, Sugar Hill, all platinum had acquired the chess catalog. And oh, okay. So what came with that was some of the art organ um, player, Solomon Burke, okay. Etta James, some, you know, so there was that whole frequency that was happening as well. And Skip and I, we, you know, we were fortunate to be able to maybe do Donnie Albert. We were, you know, we were yeah. able to do some sessions with them, and most of the stuff never came out. Um, and if it did, 
maybe it came out after the fact, you know, like it's, it's probably over in Europe or something like that. But it, it, it yeah, really I could remember uh, Gene McFadden. Yeah. We did loads of sessions with him because uh, along with doing Sugar Hill, we also did, um, there was some, a time that we spent at Hush Productions. There was a time we spent at Shakedown. There, there was a other elements that were also in the mix of what we were doing. True. Yeah, we were doing Melba Moore, Freddie Jackson, you know. Um, then also some of the, with the producers that Skip mentioned, Buddy Siegler and Gene McFadden, they ushered us into certain sessions that were in, uh, that were released on uh, Philly International, you know. Um, but as far as some bands, if I might chime in, that was really eye-opening, Parliament Funkadelic, when we opened up for them for those two months in 1979. Uh, there we saw, we met Bernie Morrell, Dennis Chambers, all of the guys in P-Funk. Philly Bay Wynn was a, would come out on knee deep and he had a guest spot. He would, he would sing Sadie, but, you know, they would play that <laughs> stuff. Like, he was killing it. So it was, um, that was a, for me, that was a, a big event. Then from there, we started playing a lot of festivals during the summer. And who would we open up for? We'd open up for Rick James, Cameo. Well, that's some of the bands on the ticket. Rick James, Cameo, Come Function, The Gap Band. Uh, who else, Skip? So, uh, it's so far now, all yeah. I know is I had fun. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Playing festivals and being out there. and and uh, But it was, you know, gotta, gotta be honest, I'll never forget the first gig we did with Parliament Funkadelic. And we rolled up, we had a beat up old bus that barely worked. <laughs> And we, we rolled up at the arena, it was in Nashville, Tennessee, and we're bringing our little amplifiers out the bay to bus. <laughs> we didn't put on that stuff in it. And I think the guys, Parliament Funkadelic, they had been on the road for a while. So those guys yeah. would go on, like just kind of. So maybe some of the folks didn't even, he didn't even know of rap music because they were in their own bubble. So I'll never forget, they came out and looked at us like, I know these country boys, what are they doing up here? What? But we won them over. We played one song, we, we had an intro, and then we went into Rapper's Delight, game over. Mass pandemonium, everybody's singing every word. I could see the, we could see the guys on the side of the stage going, wow. Hmm. They, they became our best mates to this day. I still, I'm thankful that we had that opportunity because we made, you know, Ski, Dennis, Bernie, Gary Scheider, George came out periodically, but that was a, a for me, that really kind of like, all right, we're, we're entering, we're getting into the big we're time. With the big boys. <laughs> yeah. With the big boys now. It just felt that way to me, Skip. I kind of had that kind of time. Tell me, Skip, when you, uh... Let's just go on that same tour the first night and you walk out there and you see all of these people. What goes through your mind at a time like that? My mind was actually blown. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never seen 20,000 people chomping at the bit for what we were doing. It was um, mind blowing. I think that even now, You know, like we, playing with the Beatles. It was that yeah. much of an impact. When we would play with the Sugar Hill Gang, and we did one gig at Harlem where we could barely finish the song. People are going bananas. They had to, they had to shut it down and usher, the, usher the, the, the rappers out the back door. It was like being with the, kind of whatever the Beatles experience was, it was sort of like that in the, in the black community. <laughs> Let's put it like that. That was a moment. Definitely. 
Now, I, I want you to explain something that you said earlier, and I'm going back, and you were talking about um, what, with your experience with the Sugar Hill, uh, the record, record company, that when they bought the, the chess um, album, or, or, or catalog. catalog. Okay, they explain to me the because you see, you're starting to see more and more. Somebody sold their catalog or this and the other. Um, I'm, ask, the I, I'm asking you to explain what what that really is and what it means. Well, basically, um, you have record labels. Say, like you got Chess Janet's label with a label out of Chicago. And basically, Chess Janice was bought by Sugar Hill Records. So now Sugar Hill owns all that catalog, all the music before, during, and after that time, until another deal is made. Now, it's really crazy now because I, 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 we can't find songs that we've actually done because so many companies have merged to so many other companies. And back in the day, if, if you think about it, we made jokes about it because there was loads of record companies and then there was half as many and then there was half as many and then half as many. And now if you think about major record labels, they're not that many anymore. They've all been bought up by big conglomerates. You know, if you look at now, if you think about it, um, you know, like with RCA or or, um, or Philly, Philadelphia International or Motown, they're all merged into almost one company. Well, not one company, but everything has been merged together into conglomerates. It's, it's, it's sad for musicians because it's not as many homes for musicians now. You got to uh, do things on the internet or Facebook or Twitter or whatever to actually um, get a leg up. Whereas before you would have a record company that would actually find issues and do the artwork and do the layouts and doing everything. Now it's almost like you got to do everything on your own. So, so the, the having managers and the all whole, out the window. <laughs> so, what we're talking about, what you're just sharing with me, is how the music industry has changed. Oh, definitely. Yeah. The, well, there was there was a, a a line of things that happened. You would have to have a producer. You would have to have a record label. You'd have to have a press corps. You'd have all these different people that would be involved in the making of a record, and it's all been shifted down now to um, to. Um, it's sad to say, but it's all been shifted down to internet. So, do you think uh, the musicians, the quality of musicians? is being reduced because of this? I would think so. I don't know. I, I don't know. But I think because there are so many musicians and there's such uh, intake for people that want to hear music and so many people that can play music, it makes it difficult for, say, one or two or three musicians to, uh, to get a leg up. Maybe I'm not putting it in the right way, but the, um, how can I say, um, there was one time when the um, United States would have music, Germany would have music, Japan would have music, Korea would have music, and now it's all amalgamated into one big music. Okay. You know, everybody shares information, and unfortunately, there's not enough for uh, people to uh, to uh, uh, take uh, to take hold to. 
You know, I'll chime in a little bit. I think also with technology and what has taken place over time is pluses and minuses. What's the plus? The internet, YouTube, you can go online, you can research and see, a, see somebody performing and learn and, you know, so this should be, this should be pure genius musicians out there right now with all the information that's there. There's that side of the coin. There's also the separation of people working with themselves. And there's a spirit and there's a sense of life that comes when you're working with a group of people because you have you learn how to play in the sand pit with each other, it's having mm -hmm. social skills. And that's part of the mu music as well. Uh, the music, a lot of music right now that's out is recycled in a sense. It's stuff that came from a good period and it's been sampled and recycled and it's presented in a way that is new to somebody, but say a person like Skip or, or us from our generation, you can hear certain things and kind of break it down and go, that's Marvin Gaye, that's P-Funk, that's this. So there's all these things that have been kind of that, that have been disassembled and reassembled and rebranded. And so what do we have now? We have, <clears throat> we have with technology has given, has, has taken it to where everybody can be into the game and perform. And now on, look at where we are right now. Now we are in, the, we're in COVID and so now we're dealing with the reality of, let's look at the where the economics could come from, from a band. Okay, whatever clubs that were around before COVID, are they gonna still be around after COVID? And how's that gonna play out? How, how, how's, Cause you need to be on the road now to be able to survive. Back to now, the value of what you did it, it's not that valuable anymore because are you looking at have being you know what money are you making from being having a, your song played on Spotify or whatever it's 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 not enough to survive off of mm -hmm. so like Skip says everything has been bought up by you know these major major companies your um, and BMG or Sony or whatever and it's being streamed down to be able to put up and it's put on a server so you can pay $10 a month and get everything you want to get. So what does that do for the musicians, for musicians yeah. that actually went out there and created this music? How do they get a leg up? How do they survive? Back in the, in the other record industry, so to say, it was all kind of corrupt, but there was an opportunity for you to actually um, at least perform and create a job for other folks because there were many pieces like skip said that went into making a record you had that side if you got a hit it wasn't that bad because now you're looking at if you got a hit over in the uk it's not a bad rate of what you would get every time your song is played on the radio or on bbc at prime time same as it was here in america so you were able to actually, oh, I got it. Okay, so it's 100,000 copies of a record. Now, of course, start doing the math. Most of the time, the money's not gonna go into the favor of the artist, but enough of it would go into the favor where you could actually do okay. So now you have a select few artists that found a way, in my opinion, thanks to hip hop, thanks to the hustle game, mm -hmm. to get in there and go, okay, well, this is how I got, I can get into the game. I will, you know, okay. I want a hit record. I'll go and buy a track from somebody. I'll buy a rhythm track. I'm not gonna just necessarily get in a room with somebody and maybe work it out. Some guys are just like, you can go online right now. This person will sell you a track for a thousand dollars. And you go, okay, well, let me take this and dismantle it and put, you know, it's a different, it's a different game now. How do you make a living off of it? Well, you kind of, you, you have so, to be so, able to. So Doug, I want to just stop right there and ask you, what does it mean when you say I can buy a track? What, what am okay. I getting? What am well, I what getting? It means, what, is, what it means is simple. If you go online, you can actually probably Google tracks for sale, rhythm tracks for sale, music tracks, like say, 
somebody will somebody has put together a complete recording guitar bass drums whatever they've done a whole arrangement of a song maybe no vocals on it but it would be in a file like pro tools or, or, or logic it's already laid out for you it's like a template and it's already there. You didn't have to go to an arranger or go see Skip to work out a guitar mm -hmm. part or do that. You just had to go online and have a little bit of money and go click, 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 click. They'll play. You can yeah. get a sample of that. I like that. I like that. I'll take that song. I'll take that and that. And within a few minutes, if you have some money, you could have a few songs and you could actually say, all right, and you own them. They're your songs. Somebody else sold you their, their songs. Now, or didn't sell you their song. Or didn't sell you their and, song. And, and, and now you got to find it. Yeah, now you got to. So, I mean, that's kind of where we are right now. You know, it's people in the hip hop world. It changed a lot of things. When we were now working with different hip hop artists and being around guys, I'll watch producers come into the room with another with a famous hip hop artist. And they'll and they'll be there to just play that artist some beats and they'll wait and they'll have their beats on their phone maybe 20 different grooves and they'll go yo so come over here let's just go check this out gotta be now next just 20 seconds check that out i like that one remember so within five minutes they've been able a gentleman was able to come in and hurt him him or her and present few ideas to a rapper or, or a hip hop artist, and that artist will know how to take those beats and then flip it. And that's the difference of this, of what's going on with, with how hip hop artists see things because it's coming from a street vibe. And it's, and it's, and there's- So you don't do it guitar, bass, uh, keyboards, yeah. drums, uh, arranger, and all of that, it's just bam, the track now. And the music is already on there. I mean, so the, the irony of it is somebody's playing on the, those beats. Somebody made that. There's some human being that played a guitar that sampled or a bass or some horns, and they're not going to see probably a cent from that. And that's the normal. That's the norm. It's not right. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you know people sample your song. She you know maybe she hopefully you get paid. A lot of times you don't, and you won't even know by the time they sample something and put another sample on it. And next thing you know, you're like, it sounds familiar. Yeah, because it's you. <laughs> <laughs> it is familiar. Yeah. That's you playing on that. Yeah. You don't find out till some years later. <laughs> it's what's funny. But it's not. So, so, Sugar Hill Records. Um, how was the funeral? The funeral. Well, I was just saying the ending. Yeah. I was using Ooh. the term funeral, but you know the term yeah. the Sugar Hill Records. Ah, I'll let Skip handle that one. Well, to tell you the truth, the saga is still continuing. Um, even though Joe Robinson's gone, Sylvia Robinson's gone, Joey Robinson Jr. is gone, they're still members of the family of that that are still carrying on with everyday business. Well, how vibrant is that? At the moment, nobody knows what's going on, really. You know, it's um, everybody, it's, all, it's like a free fall right now. It's a free for all and everybody's trying to um, catch up with themselves. I, I don't know if it's true or not, but um, I would think, I think the, um, the leading member of Sugar Hill would be Leland Robinson. Yeah, he's the surviving member he's the of surviving the family. Member. And I hope he's somewhere trying to uh, put some things together. Yeah. So fortunately, there is a member of the family that's still left. Because like Skip said, Sylvia, Joe, 
Joey Jr. and Rondo, all four of his family members passed. Um, and he's now the one that is um, heading up Sugar Hill. Yeah. And God bless him because the legacy of what his mom has done and what Joe has done and what they taught us, stuff that we learned from them, uh, is priceless. Um, so hopefully Leland and will be able to, con you know, continue to, um, you know, just keep Sugar Hill and the legacy of it in a good, within the good, in the good hands of good people. Yeah. And, and you know, that's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a, it, that's an American, true American story in my opinion. And it's and looking at what Sylvia and Joe did, that's a true black American story right there. What Sylvia did, a woman of color being able to create and present a genre of music that has changed everything. It wasn't for Sylvia. Who knows what how things would have turned out with the world of hip hop. She really put it on. If it wasn't for Joe Robinson being able to have the skill set and the ingenuity to maintain, um, to be stay independent as a black independent record company. Yeah, well, at, at the time, Sugar Hill was the only black owned record company. So at the time. that's right. And um, what we saw, what we witnessed, what we experienced, and what we were able to par par participate in, I got I to give it up to, to Joe and Sylvia for giving us the opportunity to be able to perform as Woodbrass and Steel, and then continuing to keep us in the mix through Sugar Hill and everything else. So the, so the, sto so the story continues. It's, it's not over. It's just starting. It's even, it's like rebirth. Look, if you keep if you keep that shirt in the closet long enough, it's gonna come back in the fashion. Of <laughs> That's true. Style, so, yeah. And then so there's nothing but good. Nothing. There's no funeral. There's nothing. It's just re. It's just life and rebirth. And thank you, Joe and Sylvie. Mm. Now, the one of the things that I I, I need to ask you both is that <clears throat> how does your whole experience relate to the funk, and how do you express yourselves when you think of the whole genre of the rap and everything that you all have done with the different musical uh, ways that you've presented yourselves? How does it circle back to being funky? <laughs> mm, that's a good question, but uh, to tell you the truth, I think rap yeah and rap music is responsible for reinsurgence of funk because the rappers wanted funky music. They would sample funky music. They would go back in time. They would take bits in, of information from Funkadelic and uh, Ohio players and all that, and they would re-energize it. Mm -hmm. So actually it came back, it was like, it was going forward to go back or going back to go forward because with the rappers, if you remember at that time in 78, 79, there was a whole house thing that was going on with computers and drum machines and all that. And Rappers was not, they weren't going to hear that ticky ticky kind of computerized music. They wanted funk. Really. If you think about it now, they still want funk. It's the same thing regurgitating over and over again because they want the real feel, I would call it. Instead of, uh, uh, what would you call it? Computer music. Well, I could chime in if you going back to those days of what Skip's talking about. A lot of the great beats were James Brown beats. Yeah. Sliding the Family Stone great beat. Yep. They're like that funk. 
and they like things that were just that made you wiggle, made you pat your foot. And that was the that was the beauty of hip hop is they didn't care. You could you could play all the crazy chords you want. They were like, that stuff sounds like it's for an older crowd. Check this out. <laughs> and you know, so because we were we were at, you know, Ryan, we were the translators. Skip and I, Keith, Craig Derry, we were that we were the first early musician translators for rappers. It was an art. It wasn't about a key. It was about a feel. It wasn't about certain things that were in a form. It was broken up and it and and, and so it so it took us to be able to understand and interpret and interpret what was happening. Most musicians musicians didn't didn't like, a lot of musicians didn't like rap music at first. They slag us, say, what are you guys, why are y'all playing with these guys? What's going on? Mm. Then a year later, you see them out there playing with, with, the, with the rap band. But we were, I would say, pioneers of interpreting as musicians what the rappers like. Why? Because we would listen to them, just listen and watch. So it became an art form and it became a way for us to, in, in, to see how things are done. But then again, you go back to the same, where's the roots of that? You know, James Brown. I mean, if James Brown didn't probably come out to where he didn't pre present funk at that time, everything has a, every action has a reaction. You know, in this great state of Ohio produced so many great funk men, Joe Tex. Well, I don't know if Joe's from Ohio, but like, but just like, you know, um, but the Osley brothers, Ohio players, um, Slave. Paul Funkadelic, all of the bands out of Dayton, Ohio, you know, uh, so on and so forth. But that funk was just, it's so hypnotic. And for a rapper, they were like, James Brown record was a, was a gold mine. They were like, I could take that beat, that beat. There's so many records that were made off of just the beats. You know, and um, so it was, you know, real musicians playing and, and they can rap over. Mm -hmm. So um, it's amazing how and what rappers have done to keep. Excuse me for one minute. Yeah. So, so it my final question, I, and I thank you so much for, this has been a wonderful conversation um, about music and the Sugar Hill Gang and the Sugar Hill Records in, in, in your history. But tell me, why do you think that the Funk Music Hall of Fame is important for us to continue to do this? and? And that it should become a reality. Well, that's a, you know, it, it's important that our heritage, that from funk music to blues, everything, rock and roll, all of that is is clear and precise in in the world, and also in the history books. It's very important to me personally that those that spent time to come up with ideas and create frequencies and find ways to punch a hole through the atmosphere to present their 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 vibes. And at, at a time that there were many challenges, you know, when funk was coming out, it was challenging for a lot of the funk art, for a lot of artists. Maybe some of them were merging from the Chitlin circuit and trying to find a way how to continue to survive, playing blues or whatever. But I gotta say, I think James Brown was a cornerstone to being able to make funk music and bring it to the public as was other artists like the Isley Brothers, and George Clinton, and, and, and many, many early folk artists. It's so how could we not honor them for all that they have done and those frequencies that they created? 
that are being sampled today. That's what everybody's sampling today. Everybody's every, so everything is regurgitated. You know, all the artists that you know, all the way down the line, they're all they've all grabbed bits from Sly and the Family Stone, or you know, um, like I mentioned, George Clinton, War, the Ohio Players. The list goes on and on and on. Bobby Walmack, Isaac Hayes, Funk from Memphis, Funk from D.C. Philly funk, all the different regions in, in America were able to create their own frequency. So we have to preserve that. That's like hot sauce. That's like every different area in the country. Like I like hot sauce from, my hot sauce is from St. Louis. Burn your lips off. My hot sauce is from Kansas City. My hot sauce is from Atlanta. But you know, it's it's that type of, of, um, of flavor that funk has. And it's created, it's it's created a multi-billion, it's a multi-billion dollar industry because funk is at the roots of a lot of different styles, especially hip hop. Thank you. Skip, do you want to add anything to that about why it's yeah, important for us to- Everything I agreed with and um, which is um, get the uh, keyboard hot. <laughs> and play those tracks. I just want to thank you, Skip McDonald and mm -hmm. and and Doug Wimpish that uh, for being with Wimbish. us. Wimbish. 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 Yeah. I thought yeah. I said Wimbish. I you said I... Wimbish. Well. <laughs> <laughs> About three times, but you know what? You can call me whatever you want to call I'm... me. I'm so as sorry, Doug. As long as you call me for dinner. Doug, well, right? that, that's, that's even a challenge because I don't cook. So, oh, um, so, so Doug, I take my humble apology. Oh, and and uh, I, I'm so sorry that I mispronounced Wimbish. Oh, there you go. I, yeah. I, I get it right. And you so on, be, on behalf of David Webb, who is the CEO of our Funk Music Hall of Fame. We just want to thank you for taking time and being with us today. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. Funky, funky, funky. <laughs> Time, y'all. Get funky with it. Rumble yeah. It.